What's the last story you told? I'll give you a second to think about it. Not tweeted or text or emailed, but what's the last story you told to someone? Got their attention, stood them in front of you, or participated in a group and told them a cracking good yarn? What happened? Did they laugh? Did they tear up? Were they angry? We've never had an easier time to share our stories, and we do, but I'm going to ask you today, are we losing something? Just a little bit. It's not a problem of words. We are awash in words. 154 billion emails. Some days I think a billion are in my mailbox. 500 million tweets. This is every day. We're tweeting 500 million times. We write 16 billion words a day in Facebook. Words everywhere, and we write 12 billion texts. But with all that data, are we really telling stories? Now, I'm not going to lecture you about technology and say we're doing too much. I love it. I use it all the time in my job. But I want you today to focus on something else. Long ago, 500 million years ago, we didn't even use words to tell stories. The first people used paintings on cave walls to tell simple stories. And then came the development of language, words, grunts, then words, and then full sentences. And now we have the power in the palm of our hand to retrieve all the world's stories in a smartphone. But with all that data, are we telling stories? You've heard a lot today about Sankofa, the Ghanaian word to reach back and take so as not to forget. Put another way, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, from the 18th century author Edmund Burke. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. A good reason to tell our stories. I want to inspire you today, and I want to ask you to come along with me on a little journey to explore the essence of story. What makes a good story? What makes you remember it? What moves you in a story? And I want you to, ch to challenge yourselves to think about the power of story. The power of story, a simple concept. I tell stories for a living. I've told thousands of stories over my long career. Many times there are stories in big world events with very important people who think they can solve the world's problems and can't. But I'll tell you, more often my work is about ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. It's about stories that have heart, because at the essence of any good story, think about it, you need to make someone care, to feel something, anger, despair, joy, laugh out loud, or be moved in some way. The heart, yes, stories have head, but the heart is the really critical part of any story. Sometimes, simple stories come from simple people. This next story is the setting is in Afghanistan, in a woman's sewing co-op. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan during the time Canadian soldiers were there fighting the Taliban. And on one occasion, I found myself in this co-op, in a home in, in Kandahar, in southern Afghanistan, with women who had simple stories. They were there to create and sew gifts, to make a little money. They were the lucky ones. Their husbands allowed them to leave their homes and come to this co-op. And as I had lunch with them and spent more time talking to them, I realized it was less of a business and more of a therapy session. Because these women would come from their homes dressed in burqas, completely anonymous, with only their feet showing. And when they came into the sewing co-op, they would take off their burqas, put them on hooks on the wall, and all of a sudden their personalities would come out. They became women, individual women. On the streets of Kandahar, they were anonymous in their burqas. And I squatted down at one point to speak to a woman named Perdita. Perdita was about five foot two, in her mid-twenties. She had five children. She lived in a mud hut house. But man, was she feisty. We were talking about the 2009 election, which I was covering, and I was asking her about the vote. Would she vote? Where would she vote? How would she vote? Did she feel safe? 
And Perdita was slow to start, and then she got going, and then she started to lecture this Western reporter about what our country was doing in Afghanistan. Perdita said, you, you told me you would come here as Canadians and Western forces to help me. You would come and make my life a little bit safer, more protected, so that I wouldn't have to worry about my children every day going to the market being killed by an IED bomb. She said, I wouldn't have to worry, I thought, about the Taliban delivering night letters to my home, threatening my husband because he delivered supplies to the nearby base. But you haven't done that. In 2009, in the elections, I don't feel that more secure. With every word, she was getting more and more animated in Pashto and really giving me a good lecture. After a while, I thought, wow, this is some woman. And I laughed and I said, Perdita, you should be running for president. And she said, well, I would, but I'm illiterate. And in that moment, as I drew in a breath, I thought about the story of Afghanistan, the story of the missed opportunity, of all that potential of Afghan women, who was which was lost in one generation because they couldn't go to school. For me, that simple story from a simple woman delivered with passion really encapsulated a lot about what we were seeing and feeling and hearing in southern Afghanistan. And then she said, but my daughters, my youngest daughters, they are going to school. It had a wonderful impact on me, and I really never forgot Perdita, and I've told her story many times. Such a simple story. There is a power in story, and I ask you to think about right now, whose story do you know that's worth telling? We all have stories. We meet interesting people, all of us. What about your own story? They say everyone has a story in them. We have hundreds inside ourselves. When's the last time that you sat down and did notes about a story that you wanted to tell someone later? It's not a question of words. We've heard that. Clive Johnson, who's a tech thinker and writer, a Canadian, did a back-of-the-napkin estimate one day and suggested that there are 3.6 trillion words on the internet. That's more than all the books in the US Library of Congress, 36 million books. That's how much stuff is out there. But again, are we sharing data or telling stories? Our children, from a very young age, are encouraged to read, read, read. And then as we get older, we're encouraged to write reports and essays. But what about story? We, as we get out of university, we are crunching da data. We are filling up Word documents. We're writing emails and more reports. But again, are we telling stories? We don't write letters much anymore. There's a reason, a scientific reason, we like stories. And it all has to do with neuroscience. It's fascinating. For decades, scientists have told us that, in fact, when we hear a story, when we read a story, it's the classical regions of our brain which are decoding the symbols that allow us to learn to read. But more recently, we've learned even more about what happens. What happens in the brain? So, for example, if I tell you a story about cold, juicy popsicles on a hot day, these ones flavored with Amazon fruits. Guess what happens in your brain? The part of your brain that regulates taste lights up. They've shown this in MRI tests. It actually is engaged. The same thing happens with movement. So if I tell you that a World Cup protester last week was pelting police with stones, the only ammunition he had, Guess what happens? Your motor cortex lights up. So what this tells us is that when a story is well told and well delivered, you have a similar experience to experience, you have a similar way of experiencing it as the storyteller. So I can invite you to come along with me to the places I'm going and share some of the stories. It's why we're moved by stories. You can take it even further, and this will interest the educators. A singer with a velvety voice, or men with leathery hands. Guess what happens? In your brain, the sense of touch is going off like this. It's activated, it's lighting up. But guess what else? If you use passive language, the singer had a pleasing voice, and the men had strong hands, doesn't light up. 
They've proven it. So for all you students out there and all you educators who are trying to suggest that students write with active verbs and descriptive language and choosing a different word to describe action, listen up, we're listening to neuroscience talking. We also have many stories involved in our family lives. You know, you may think that your stories aren't worth telling, but think of those funny rules in your family life. I remember the one about the turkey, the cat, and the grandmother. The turkey was dead, the cat was alive, and the grandmother hated cats. The setting was Christmas dinner, and as we took the 18-pound beautiful turkey out of the oven and put it on the counter and went to another room, the cat leaped on the counter and tore apart one side of the turkey. The entire breast, gone, mauled. My mother went in, looked at the turkey, said, what to do, what are we going to do? Grandma's here for dinner, the turkey is a mess. My father said, we're going to serve that turkey. We put it on a platter, we delivered it to the table with the good side out. The turkey breast facing grandma and the mauled side facing dad. And he carved away and she never knew the difference. <laughs> Those stories live on, don't they, in our families all the time. This time, the family story suggested a stage and time in our lives and as parents what we do. The setting this time, Afghanistan. It's a few days before Easter. I'm there, the kids and my husband are at home celebrating Easter. I'm just about to jump into the back of this armored person personnel carrier to take a dangerous trip down a road uh, to a forward operating base. We drove at night so that we weren't interrupted by IEDs, we hoped. Just as I'm getting in about midnight, my cell phone goes off. It's my son on the other end. Mommy? I'm going, yes, Aiden, what's wrong? Mommy, as he hears my voice, the sobs, I know there's no Easter bunny. I'm thinking thousands of miles away, feeling very guilt guilty to do remote parenting. I had no way of, of helping him, of calming him down. I said, Aiden, why do you think that? I saw the empty eggs in daddy's bedroom, the plastic ones, and there's nothing in them. The commander is saying, hop in, we gotta go. We're on a schedule, military timetable, let's go. I thought, what am I gonna do here? I was feeling very guilty by then. Suddenly, an inspiration. I said, Aiden, if you don't believe, you won't receive. <laughs> there was a big pause on the other end of the line and the voice grew a little bit stronger and he said, well, mommy, I don't believe as much as I used to. <laughs> Problem solved. Another family story, a little one, that became a legend. Some stories are bigger and inform the world, like the story of Nelson Mandela, the story of a black man who grew up in rural South Africa, became a guerrilla fighter, and then a prisoner, and finally a president. He freed a country. And when he died, I saw people lined up in Pretoria, in the Union buildings when he was laid out in state, and they were lined up to see the end of the living story of Nelson Mandela. His legacy would go on, yes, but the living part of that story for them was over. And I saw thousands of women weeping, and men crumbled as they passed by his casket. And for me, the intersection of world events and family, because just prior to getting to South Africa, the day before, I had buried my own father at 99. So I was reliving the story of my father's death and the father of a country in one moment, and I did weep as well. It's often the survivors in death who have to pass on the power of story. In this case, the setting was Libya. In Tripoli, the rebels had taken over Tripoli. Muammar Gaddafi's image was in the waste basket unthinkable days before. We went to find a story we'd heard about, a horrif horrifying story, and we found it in a metal shed next to an abandoned, bombed-out base. It was about the size of two garages. It was dark inside, with just the light streaming through the open door. And as we walked in and our eyes adjusted to the dimness, we saw a man in white standing amongst bones. Six days before, this man had been imprisoned with dozens of others, imprisoned because he opposed Gaddafi. And when the, the Gaddafi's murderous mercenaries fled, in a final penalty, they threw grenades into that metal building and incinerated everyone inside. 
except for this man, who snuck out through a bit of a torn piece of corrugated metal in the corner and fled. And on the day we were there, this survivor came back to tell us the story, the powerful story of what happened, which helped inform us about why Libyans had finally ousted Muammar Gaddafi. He was the survivor and able to tell us the story. Those who don't know history, those who don't know past stories, are doomed, are bound to repeat mistakes. It's a lesson for us all. I'm asking you today, in all this data and information swirling around us, are we losing the ancient tools of telling a good yarn, a good descriptive narration with a high point, a twist, an arc, maybe a punchline at the end? Stories that stimulate our brains, that have heart, that have meaning to us. So I'm asking you today, as you leave this room, what's the next story you'll tell? Will it inspire someone? Will it make them cry? Will it make them angry? I challenge you today. Go out and tell a story. See what happens. Thank you. <laughs>